Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all here with us. We'll give it just a minute to make sure that everybody else has been able to join on this wonderful meet and greet. So we'll, we'll hang on just a moment and get started. Make sure all the technology is working for everybody. Sometimes it takes a minute or two to get logged oh, yeah. in. So we'll give folks a second. Um, but worst case, all they're going to miss at this point is my introduction. So I think we can go ahead and roll with that. The meat of the program, of course, is coming up here in a few minutes. Um, good afternoon and welcome to the virtual meet and greet with Clyde Butcher. My name is Nancy Turrell. I am the executive director of the Arts Council of Martin County and pleased to introduce this session to you today. Our mission at the Arts Council is to inspire participation and passion for the arts Arts education, promoting the arts, nurturing artists, supporting arts organizations is all part of what we do for our community. The Arts Council has been curating exhibitions in the Courthouse Cultural Center since 1991. In fact, 30 years ago, our first exhibition after renovating the space to be a gallery featured Ansel Adams photographs, which were on loan from the Mitsubishi collection. We are celebrating the 30th anniversary in the space and paying tribute to the tradition Adams set out in pho photographing our national parks by having the America's Everglades exhibit by Clyde Butcher on view through March 13th. If you haven't been to our space, I encourage you to come down to downtown Stewart and experience the amazing works in person. There really is no substitute for seeing the images live. Funding for this exhibition comes from private sponsors like Mutual of America and Misty Moody with GEICO, but also from the National Endowment for the Arts. Their CARES COVID relief grant ensured that we were able to bring this exhibition to fruition, so I'm grateful for the support that we have. Today's program is presented in partnership with Friends of the Everglades, so I'm happy to turn the microphone over to my friend Eve Samples, who I've known through her time in her previous life as a journalist and now as Executive Director for Friends of the Everglades. Take it away, Eve. Thanks, Nancy. It is a real honor to participate today with Clyde Butcher, who I'm going to introduce to you in a moment. And I'm just thrilled to see the first slide in Clyde's presentation includes our founder, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, who founded Friends of the Everglades in 1969. So this feels incredibly meaningful. I'm going to tell you a bit about Clyde now and then hand it over to him for a presentation because I know that's what everyone's eager to hear about his remarkable work. Clyde Butcher is an acclaimed photographer who for 50 years has made it his mission to photograph and document natural places across the United States and abroad. He grew up in California and relocated to Florida in the late 1970s, finding peace and his life's mission within the Everglades. His photographs capture remarkable feelings of solitude and wonder. Clyde is a recipient of the Florida Artist Hall of Fame Award and the Lifetime Achievement Award from the North American Nature Photography Association, among many other honors. He's not only an award-winning artist, he's also a conservationist. And on the back cover of his new book, The Everglades, you will find this quote, which I think captures his philosophy. It reads, it is my hope that the vision I give to you of the Everglades will inspire you to love and protect it for generations to come. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Clyde Butcher. Welcome, Clyde. Hi, thank you, thanks for having me here. Well, you know, your first slide is Marjorie and uh, I was we were celebrating her, her 101st birthday. So I did this poster that, and she was signing it. Uh, it was really, she was, at 101, she was sharp as a tack. But people don't realize that uh, when she she actually kind of defined the Everglades in 1947 when she wrote the River of Grass, and but she didn't really start her real environmental movement I think until she was in her 70s. And then she got down to business to try to save the Everglades, besides just explaining what they were. So uh, I it was really a privilege to meet her. I met her twice. Um, also, when she was 100, 104, she was still sharp 104. The Everglades uh, really starts at uh, at Orlando. People don't realize that this this is the system is a, a, a north to south drainage system. Re I consider the, the top of it is Reedy Creek. This is a picture of Reedy Creek uh, going into Lake Oak, Lake Lake Kissimmee. 
Now Lake Kissimmee uh, is kind of like the headwaters of the Kissimmee River. And in uh, <clears throat> the water management district, uh, I was working with them uh, on a project on the Kissimmee, Kissimmee River. Um, Kissimmee River was created in 1960, 71. It was a control flood. It drained 60% of the wetlands. Distributed hydro, it was distributing the cycle, lowered plant diversity, lowered fish and waterfowl diversity. Uh, and then uh, we, the, when we started the restoration, it was a very slow start, but I think it was Jeb Bush that really got on, on the stick. And between the uh, Corps of Engineers, water management, uh, the uh, Air Force, the ranchers, the farmers, and the citizens got together to solve the problem. As you can see on the left here is where the, the, the Kissimmee ditch was. And they put it back to its normal flow. And then when they, in the uh, summer when it floods, the water goes everywhere like it used to go and, and cleans it going down the, the, uh, to, to, the, to Lake Okeechobee. Uh, so we were we were out in the airboats, and it was really interesting. It was it was so it was so interesting that we 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 get in situations where we couldn't figure out where we were. That's how great it was, and uh, and and th these were the people that court. This is the water management district, and you have to understand. I learned or got the information and this inspiration on saving the Everglades, actually from the South Water Management District. They really explained to me what the whole system was about. And because that, that was important for me to understand what the problems were. And this is, now this is after the restoration. You can see that the, this used to be a cattle. And now it's, it's a marsh, which now cleans the water and the birds are back. I mean, this was in October and there were a huge amount of birds there. It was amazing for October to have that many birds. And then from there, it goes down to Lake Okeechobee. Lake Okeechobee is a big old lake that they don't know what to do with yet. It's um, 30 miles in diameter, full of polluted ground. Now, this was kind of a fun picture. I mean, people say, are, are alligators dangerous? Well, this was the most dangerous thing I've come across so far is this cow. And she had her horns wrapped around my camera. And what do you do with a 2000 pound cow? But there's still, there's still small cow, cow business, but that's, that's what's polluting the, the river is the cow and houses and ministry. And people, we have to understand that what we do Everything we do affects everything. Now, this is the conservation area, which is one of the, uh, the areas that cleans the water that's going into the Everglades. And with the two bridges that they've got now, hopefully we'll be getting more, hopefully, clean water into the Everglades National Park. Now, this is one of the first pictures I took when I went to black, back to black and white. I, I thought this grass was sawgrass until I discovered it was cattails. And the reason cattails were here, this area here was in Ochopee, which had potato, potato farm, not potato, tomato farming for years. They would bring train loads of manure down. They would take oxen with like snowshoes on the oxen and kind of go, go so, you could see the, the, the troughs where they would raise up the mud and put, put manure in to fertilize it because the Everglades is, is nutrient poor. But this, is, this was done in the, I think it was probably in the 30s and it's still polluting. Uh, it takes a long time to get the nutrients out of the water. This is what the Everglades should look like. A beautiful grass with flowers uh, rolling down and just, just in, if you fly over this in a helicopter, 
it's endless. It's really an interesting thing to see it in a helicopter. And then there's areas where we have a lot of cypress and this particular, and cy these cypress trees are called dwarf cypress. And the water, the, it, the, the earth is like, uh, it's, it's coral, it's not coral, it's uh, limestone. So there's not enough um, mud to have big trees. So you see all these little trees are probably much older than the big trees because these things don't have, it's like a bunch of big giant bonsai forests. Then you get, this is down south of the road where you get into the real, real Everglades. I mean, this, this, um, this is what it all looked like from Okeechobee, from, from Lake Okeechobee all the way down to the Everglades. This is what it all used to look like. Some people said it was so thick you could walk on top of it. And there, what, what there is in, in Big Cypress and Everglades is called strands. Where they're like rivers that run through. And this, this is a river that's actually running through in front of our gallery. Now, using an eight by 10 camera uh, is a little tricky. It's, uh, the exposures, this, this is a six minute exposure. So nothing can move for six minutes. And you know how much everything likes to move in the, in the Everglades. If there's the least bit of wind, I would have to start over again. This, but this was, unfortunately, these are Gosmania and they're getting killed by the uh, little beetles that uh, are, are laid, their, their eggs are laid in, into them and then they hatch, they eat the roots and they're disappearing. But they're, that's, that's a long, long story. But the orchids, there's orchids all over the place in the in in Big Cypress, and big well Big Cypress, Pakahatchee, Conservation, Everglades National Park is, is all I could people are considered the Everglades. It's all one system really. And you can see the little the little orchid with a big giant camera is fun to photograph. But it's 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 a challenge to get these things photographed with a large format camera. This one, this was I shot in 1999. It was really it was fun getting to it because you had to get there before the sun came up, and we had to walk about an hour and a half through the swamp in semi darkness. And that's if, if you haven't done that, that can get kind of exciting. You have all these neat, neat sounds coming out, and you don't want. I wonder what that one was, you know. And the bird population is coming back, uh, particularly uh, in, in Kissimmee and Big Cypress because they're, we're, we're getting rid of some of the, the, the water so the water level is lower. Red shoulder hawks are, are really kind of a fun, fun thing to watch. Well, th this, this is just, I mean, how, how do you have a place like this in places in the world? Then the south of the Everglades uh, woodlands is in Florida Bay. And this is a friend, I met this fellow in a, a presentation I did at the Key Largo Library. And he said, I'd like to take you around the photograph. And I, I'm used to a canoe and this little thing has a 300 horsepower engine. It really kind of moves. So all day we were chasing clouds. And like this was, I don't, we have no idea where we were when we took this picture. We just stopped the boat. I got out of the boat, got in the water, and took this great image. This gives you the power of the, of the Everglades. The, the storms, are, I think, are the powers. Now, this is one of my silly cameras. It's kind of a, overkill, it's a 12 by 20. It's not like, like taking a, a TV camera out there. And you can see I'm the anchor, the boat's wrapped around my waist so I can um, get my film holders out. But what I'm trying to do is give you a feeling of being there. So I have to be in the water. You can't take this from a boat. Because also that camera is long exposure. So it's, it's really important to be, be in the environment when you're taking these photographs. This is our gallery in Big Cypress. 
as you can see, we're right in the, we're actually in the very center of the Everglades. We're 50 miles from Publix in Miami and 50 miles Publix in Naples. So we are in the center. We had a bear come and steal Nikki's purse out of the car one day. Uh, I mean, it, we have, uh, it's really a very interesting place. And we have a, a gallery there, we give swamp walks. Uh, we gave President Carter a swamp walk, uh, I think it was 19, 2002, when he was 80 years old in his family. He was really, was really a neat guy. And then we have also have a gallery and it's where all of our production and dark rooms in Venice, Florida. This is where I do the dark room work and mount, frame the pictures and have a, have a gallery there. And you can see these guys have had, people have a ball. People don't understand the Everglades until you get in there and walk into it. And normally it, it, we get up sometimes to your thigh in water. Um, so far, we haven't had any problems. We've had about maybe, I don't know, 10,000 people through. And gators and snakes, they don't want anything to do with people. And we give everybody a stick. Stick is the most, uh, most, the best weapon to uh, defend any, <clears throat> any kind of uh, animal because you just you just kind of make them you, you ignore, okay, okay, you just want them to go away. You don't want to hurt them. So a stick is really fun. We've had, I had a snake one time, we had a water mox, and we just took the, took the uh, wooden stick and just walked him out, out in the woods, and there he went. Now this is one of my favorite pictures, Oscar Thompson, which is my one of my best friends. Um, this was in September, and he um, he died on me. And um, this was the last time we were with him since September. We were out looking for ghost orchids, and sometimes you wish you would. This this is this next picture is one that uh, wouldn't it be nice to take that picture. But what it does, if you look at this and you feel this picture, we're a spaceship. You, you know, we think that this whole, you know, your, your ground is flat, but everything we do, everything everybody else does in the world affects the whole world. So we have to think broadly. We can't think, we have to think locally, but we also have to think worldly if we're going to solve and, and create a world that's safe and beautiful to live in. And I think that's really important. Now, I'm, I'm finished, but what do I do? I'm back, Clyde. That was remarkable. And I had the privilege of doing a swamp walk recently with uh, one of my staffers from Friends of the Everglades, Allie. And we were about waist deep, but not quite as deep as you showed in that last picture there. So your, your uh, experience is incredible and it really comes through in every photograph you take. And I, I want to start off with the- should, should I get rid of this, uh, should I get rid of the screen? You can leave. Uh, do you want to go back to one of your favorite photos in, in that reel? Maybe I like this is my favorite photograph. <laughs> well, we can leave it there. Then. I, I'm going to ask you if you and, and if the audience has any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll, we'll sure. get to those. But Clyde, this picture is actually perfect for the first thing I want to ask you about, because in, in your new book, The Everglades, you describe what it felt like to be immersed in the Everglades and the swamp for the first time. And you called it a primeval experience. And, and you said it's when it dawned on you that we humans are part of a greater whole. And I'm hoping you can take us back to that moment and what you felt. Well, well you know, you're, you're out there and you're, you're surrounded. You have to realize um, when we first uh, got the property where our gallery was, uh, I don't had anybody walk in there for years. I mean, and you're, you're out there and you think, you know, is a dinosaur going to come over the horizon? I mean, and I was a little nervous because, you know, I'm from California. And I've seen these pictures of alligators and snakes and all this stuff. But Oscar, which is my best friend, was telling me, well, you know, they have no interest in you. 
the problems you have is where uh, golf courses, places of people's behind people's houses where uh, they they feed the gators. But in the wilderness, gators are not scared of you. So I, I was I I really got used. To, I got the sense that I was okay. The water is crystal clear. Uh, it was it was a it's it's hard to it's hard to describe it unless you're out there. That how wonderful it is. And I don't think there's anything like this anywhere else in the world. Uh, Everglades, I think, is unique. Um, like the Parafighton, it, it does some marvelous things. I mean, it, all these things that it, it's figured out over the years. Uh, the Parafighton dries down in the spring and keeps it, it keeps the uh, moisture wet. All of the uh, fish and uh, frogs and crawdads put their eggs under it. And then when the, when the spring comes, the water that come back and it's moving water and it's filtering all the pollution out of the water and it's, it's droplets is, is um, um, rock. So it's taking shit, and putting it into rock. I, I think, I, I mean, that's pretty marvelous. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's uh, it's hard to describe. You have to go well. I mean, I was when I took out uh, the president, the Secret Service gal was. I was with. Uh, it was like four Secret Service people. This gal was one of the, one of the for for um, um, President Carter's wife, and she said, "I can't believe they're making me do this." And she said, but I got to do it, you know. About 15, 20 minutes into the walk, she said, I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this. <laughs> I mean, it was from complete terror to complete enjoyment. It was really, really very exciting. So I think that it's like a big giant womb. It just gives, feels good. Mm. That's, that's poetically put. So I'm sure you get this next question all the time. The question is, why did you move to black and white and not color? I understand you, you started with color early in your career and, and, and why have you stuck with it? Well, I actually, I started in the 60s in black and white. Mm -hmm. and then in about 72, I went to color so I could match people's shag carpet, gold couches and earth tones. And then I was, uh, after I started, I didn't start photographing the swamp until 1984. And people were getting, actually it was, it was really interesting when I would go to an art show, people would ask me, is this in the Amazon? Or is this, where's this, is this? Oh, it must, it must, must be in Africa. And I said, no, it's down the street. And people were getting excited about it but I felt that they really weren't understanding it. So, cause sometimes there's so much color in the Everglades that you're seeing the color and you're not seeing the essence of what you're, what you're in. And when black and white simplifies it, I think you have a better feeling. I mean, what's more important, air or water? Everything has the same importance mm. and black and white gives a oneness to the environment. So everything balances out and you have to have balance in life. Um, I, I, I hope that it kind of explains it. It does. And, and could you hit the back arrow so we can see one of those remarkable black and white photos? Okay, well, let's see, is this a is that, is that one okay? Is that Florida Bay, did you say? Yeah. How about uh, that one? That's stunning. And, and, and when you're out in the Everglades, that, that lush greenery can really envelop yeah. you. And, and yeah, yeah. You, you, all you would see is green here. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't see the individual leaves and the flowers are yellow and that's green. So there, there'd be a, you know, a, a conflict, you might say, between the two. But here it's it's all it's all one. The background is all green. This is green. That, everything is green. First time I saw some pictures of it of the greenness, I kind of want to throw up. 
<laughs> so much green. I wanted to see what was there. I, I wanted to see the texture. I wanted to see the composition. Hmm. That's that's fascinating. We've seen the wrong kind of green in our our waters in Stewart um, in recent years. So. Oh yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I think we had a lot of rain this year. I was out Everglade National National Park in December and January, and the water is high. So I assume that means there's going to be dumping like Okeechobee. We'll be bringing more good stuff down. We are concerned about that. The lake is about two feet higher than normal for this time of year. And, no, and your work is, is the Everglades, so the Everglades was really pretty though. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> that's why gorgeous. we were up to our waist. <laughs> it was gorgeous. Uh, another question for you. So anyone who's been to your gallery or has already been to the Courthouse Cultural Center in Stewart, which I have a, a virtual image of behind me here, has seen the very large format of your photos. And I hope right. you could tell us a bit about that process. I'm sure it's not easy to print photos that way, but why do you go so large? Well, okay. I make my pictures large so you can't see them. Tell me more. Does that make sense? <laughs> no. Well, people don't understand how they see. You only see about four or five degrees. So to see a large photograph, you have to scan it. And by scanning it, it gives you that feeling of being there subconsciously. And that's what I don't want, you, I mean, the, the composition has got to be good, but I want you to see the, all the little details, the paraphyton, the bladder warts, the fern, you know, everything. And so you have to explore it. Now, like an eight foot picture, if you were four feet away, it becomes three dimensional. Hmm. You feel like you could, particularly sometimes I do verticals that size, you feel like you can walk right into them. And that's, I'm, I'm trying to connect people because a lot of people don't want to get wet. But, I, and it's sometimes it's hard to see the beauty with the chaos. And one thing that uh, I get problems with scientists, I, I said, I, I like to make order out of the chaos. And if I don't see chaos, it's not in biological order. And I get all upset, upset because chaos means it is because everything is working together. And if everything was just, everything was the same, it would be, I can tell I think it's been destroyed by man if everything is the same. You look and they, they plant three palm trees or they plant five palm trees, but I always, well, I always look for chaos in nature because that gives you a feeling of being there because that's what's natural. Hmm. That, that's a good segue. Um, and, and you alluded to the pollution and other threats the Everglades face. But of course, Florida's population has grown massively since you started documenting Florida. And, oh, yeah. And of course, since Marjorie Stoneman Douglas wrote River of Grass in 1947. So I was really struck uh, in your new book in the foreword uh, by something you wrote. Um, you wrote, suddenly my photographs were becoming history rather than images of how Florida presently appeared. I'm wondering, how, how do you hope people will use and receive your art as a catalyst for protecting what's left? It, it's a challenge. Um, you know, in, in language, there's four letter words that people don't like to say, but in politics, there's four word words. When you talk to a politician about something, the first thing that come out of his mouth, it costs too much. So, what does it cost? It also costs too much to live. It's, it's cheaper if you die. So costing is sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a figure that people don't understand that if you spend a little bit more money in the, in the foreground, it'll save money in the long run. Like this whole restoration, if they hadn't have done that, we wouldn't have done that restoration. I mean, how many, I think, because semi-restoration was, I don't know, 
four billion dollars. Not sure exactly what it was. Billion. It, it was a lot of money. Uh, and, I've, and, and Jeb Bush is the guy I think that pushed that through. People forget about Jeb because of the, all the politics. But he did a, he did a really uh, a lot of work on uh, particularly the Western Everglades and the uh, uh, the Kissimmee because because the Kissimmee when water management used to take kids school kids out on the Kissimmee Canal and they would measure the water quality and it would be parts in million. And now when they take kids out, they can't measure it because it's parts per billion. Mm -hmm. So you can see that, but it's still not good, but it's a lot better than it was. I mean, a lot better. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the, it's one of the uh, top restoration projects in the world. Not really anybody knows about it. It's Do you mind really scrolling bad. back to that photo, Clyde, so people can see what we're talking about? The, the, the Army Corps of Engineers restored the oxbows in the Kissimmee River, which through man's follies was channelized um, in, in the 20th century. And you can see that that scar on the left is the old channel. Yeah, well, you know, uh, I did my first uh, project for the Corps, for the water management in 89. They had put a um, partial blockage of, of it to push water back into the old stream. And it was one dirty water. It was, it was scary. I got, I, I saw this great shot. I had to get out of the boat to take it. I had <laughs> problems for about a month <laughs> all kinds of stuff you wouldn't want to talk about. <laughs> uh, you, basically I was in cow shit. <laughs> uh, the, 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 but the cows, there still are cows there, but there are very few of them. They're just kind of like, almost like wild cows. Uh, I've seen a couple here and there, but not very many. Uh, but there used to be uh, milk farms, cow farms for milk, thousands in, a, in, a, in a one lot, and it was full of shit going down into the, into the river. And then, because so, the problem is now is all that stuff has gone down in the Lake Okeechobee. Lake Okeechobee is so polluted. I've talked to the Corps, I talked to water management. They have no idea how to fix that. So the only thing they can fix is the water going out of it. Mm -hmm. So my only thought is, is that they have to do on the Caloosahatchee and the St. Lucie, just the same as they did on the Kissimmee, Kissimmee River restoration. They've got to buy 50 or 60,000 acres and put the water just like it did here, make it back into a marsh to clean the water before it gets to the city, to the coast. Um, that's my only, I only think, I, I think that's the only solution myself is to clean the water before it hits the ocean. It, it reminds me of a quote from Ernest Lyons, who was the editor of the Stuart News many years ago. I believe you might even have a book of his in your gallery in Big Cypress in the shop. But he said, what men do, they can undo. And, and we see that here with the Kissimmee, but there's a lot more undoing that needs to be done and a lot more restoration of, of land. So it, it can feel quite daunting, but I have to say, Clyde, as an advocate, um, your images of the beauty really help keep us going and, and remind us what we're fighting for. Um, so thank you for that. Well, it's, it's like I say, it's, uh, I've been around, I'm in almost only, well, I've only been one, one state I haven't been in, that's uh, North Dakota. And obviously I think the Everglades, uh, of, well, and Florida is probably the most unique place in the United States. And people say, oh, Yosemite is great and, and Glacier is neat. But Florida is a living, creepy place. It's a living <laughs> place. It's not a bunch of rocks. Mm -hmm. And I like living things. Um, so I, I think, but unfortunately, we have a good, for financial, we have a good tax base that people want to move here. A lot of people are getting out of New York and, 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 California and coming here. Uh, so we're going to have a real challenge um, in all kinds of ways, electricity, 
uh, sewer, water. We have a lot of water, but it's also very uh, susceptible. I mean, the, the whole, you know, people don't realize Florida is like a, um, a rock sponge. Uh, like this canal uh, you see on the left here, uh, it was going south, but on each side of it, east and west, there's drainage. Uh, so it'll, it'll uh, actually seep into the water, water system because of the way the whole thing is built. So it's, it's a very fragile state. We are, we, we, we are what are you going to do with a bunch of, I mean, you, you see people like, like, like Yosemite, well, they're not gonna, like, what can you hurt there? It's a bunch of rocks, you know? Um, so we, we have a real challenge to be able to give these new people uh, energy and water and get rid of all the sewer. And that's, there's, that's basically, and, I, and it's some things that the, some politicians try to ignore. They just said, oh, we need more tax base, so we'll make some more houses. So where are they going to get the water? Where are they going to put the waste? Uh, mm -hmm. I was, I, I, ever since that we've been here, we have, we've only been here since 1980. But 1980, in, in Big Cypress, the Everglades, at about 2.30, 3 o'clock in, in the summertime, you'd have the showers coming in and it cooled down to 70, 75 degrees and it, when it was 90 outside. And now showers are coming later. They were, they were at four and five, sometimes six now. There's so much concrete on both sides of the coast that's it's changing the weather patterns. Mm -hmm. So it's- Could you, could you pull up that cloud, chasing cloud photo, Clyde? I think that that is a nice backdrop to what you're talking about. And, and I love how you describe- Wrong way, wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. And, and know, it's, it's really ahead. fun to uh, to watch a cloud develop. The fellow that took us out here uh, had lived in the Keys for 20 years, and he had never stopped for three or four hours to watch a cloud develop. Hmm. Uh, if you if you haven't done that, it's really exciting to uh, to to see this cloud develop. Do you think you have more patience than most people, Clyde? Huh? Do you think you have more patience than most people? Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. Well, Florida moves. I mean, you use a large format camera. You're talking the fastest shutter speed I think I've ever used is a second. Uh, a lot of the pictures I take in, in the woods are two to six minutes. So that means nothing can move. Uh, the picture I took in the back of the, of the gallery is called uh, Loose Screw Number Two. I worked every day for two weeks on that shot. I left, I left the camera out in the tripod in the swamp. I go out every morning. It took two weeks to get that photograph. Hmm. And then the one, if you saw that uh, the, uh, uh, well, let's see if I can go back. Anyhow, let's see if I can go back here. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, nope, going the wrong way again. That's okay. They're fun to see. Um, now this shot here, mm -hmm. I found this composition in January 1st, 2000. I went back every year for nine years before I got the photograph. Wow. And it's like a two hour walk to the swamp to get there. It took me nine years to get the, the water right, the plants right, the sun right, the wind right, get all the elements working together. So I knew I wanted to get that photograph. <laughs> I thought it was gorgeous. It really, to me, it says what the, the, what the Everglades used to look like uh, south of Lake Okeechobee, mm -hmm. where all the sugar is. Now, this is what it all used to look like. Uh, the, the swamp apple trees and, you know, it, it was... It was like that, and I wanted to show that again. It, it's, it's hard to find an area like this. Mm. 
we're, we're getting some good audience questions and I want to spend the remainder of the time we have getting through as many of them as we can. So the first one is a, a technical photography question. Yeah. What type of eight by 10 view camera did you use? What was your favorite lens and type of film? Okay, it was an uh, eight by 10 Deerdorf. Uh, my favorite lens was a 90 millimeter uh, X, uh, Super Angulon XL. Uh, it actually created a, 10, a six by 10 image because it didn't quite cover the whole thing. And the other one I used was a 120 millimeter Nikkor. And I always used T-Max 100. It only had 100 ASA and I, I shot it in normal. So that's one of the reasons that I wanted the fine grain. So when I blew a picture up to eight foot, it would be, would be in focus and sharp and no grain. Great, thank you. I love this next question. Ashley writes, with so much worry in the world, including worries about the keeping of our earth, what have you seen in the progression of the Everglades that gives you hope today? This may sound really weird, but it's Elon Musk. Hmm. Say more about that. Well, if you don't, he's out there trying to solve the problem of global warming. If you don't solve the problem of global warming, it ain't gonna matter what we do in the Everglades. It's gonna be, well, where I'm sitting here now in Venice, I think the water used to be 90 feet deep here. And there, the global warming, I, I had a, uh, a scientist, the, the main scientist for Greenland was staying in, in, our, in our cottage a couple of years ago. And as soon as I found out who he was, I, I <laughs> poor guy, I, I sat down and said, we got, I got to talk to you about this uh, global warming deal. And he said, in Greenland, Greenland is one of the major problems, I mean, major ice there. And he says, it's a lot worse than people think it is. Um, when I was the Corps of Engineers, uh, in 1997, uh, the, uh, Colonel Rice gave my wife and I a, a tour of, of the Corps in Jacksonville. It was two days, 110 people gave us presentations in two days. And one of them was designing walls around the cities of Florida. Wow. Did that give you an idea? Mm -hmm. This is the Corps of Engineers, not the Sierra Club. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we got to start thinking about the big picture but it's nice to concentrate on small little pictures too, because that's really important. But we also have to look at the big picture and the big picture is solutions like Elon Musk. Um, now I have at my house here in Venice, we have enough solar to run the house, the air conditioning and, and, and charge my car. We have 900 square foot house, 900 square foot house, not a big house. Mm -hmm. We, we make enough electricity for that and we get back a hundred dollars a year at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So our footprint is on um, um, energy is zero. And in the swap, we have uh, uh, 11,000 Watts on, on the house and uh, three Tesla batteries. So it's, it's uh, independent. So we're trying to do what we can do personally. And, and, and I was listening to some of these, uh, this, this newscasts it was uh, uh, on Fox. I can't remember the uh, people. I don't remember people's names. But the news guy was talking to. I guess it was it was a person uh, in charge of, of energy or the environment. I can't remember exactly what it was for, for. And he said to her, "Well, I hear Bernie took a took a private jet." And she she avoided the whole thing. And she should have said that he, that was wrong. Every person has to take personal responsibility in who you are or what you're doing. You have to take personal responsibility for what you're doing. You, you can, he, I know he's working on the big picture, but you got to start working on what you are doing. And, and that's important what every person is doing. And I, I haven't met many environmentalists that are doing anything personally other than trying to complain. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the biggest thing I get is people complaining and not doing. I'm, I'm hopeful about 
the next generation. I do see high school and some college students walking the walk in in a hopeful way, especially. We don't, have, we, we don't have we don't have enough time. There's not enough time for that. <laughs> it's, yeah. You can always throw it off to the next generation, mm -hmm. but it ain't gonna work. Ain't There's gonna urgency. Mm -hmm. No, I, I take that point. All right, I'm gonna jump into a couple more questions here, Clyde. Sure. sure. How did you learn and develop as a photographer and what do you consider most important to your work now? Well, that's a, I, I think a couple of hours. Um, well, I just started out photographing. Uh, I, I was an architecture, I was an architecture and I couldn't draw. So I ended up building models and figured out how to photograph them and photographs with presentations. And after I was in, in the architecture for, for a while, I was, I was um, uh, going, I went to Yosemite a couple of times and saw Ansel Adams work and I said, oh, I could do that. It took me a while. So I just, I just decided I wanted to do it. So I just did it. What was the other part of the question? And what do you consider most important to your work now? Most important is the people see it. That's why we have this traveling show, so people can get an idea. I have a, a show that I donated to the Florida History Museum up in Tallahassee. It was in 1989. And when I brought all the photographs up there, the, the people that ran the hist History Museum asked me if my father had done all these pictures. And I said, I, I don't understand the question. Well, this doesn't exist anymore, does it? Hmm. This is the history museum. Because they don't get out. I was talking to a person in the gallery yesterday. They're going, they're going to do a project on Sarasota, the town of Sarasota. I said, well, who cares about the town of Sarasota? Do you ever go out into the woods? No, no, I don't want to do that. So people are not connected to the environment. When they're not connected to the environment, environment they don't see the importance of it so i'm trying to trying to say that it's beautiful it's something everybody should do and see it's just a tough sell because people are so disconnected that's why we give swamp walks mm -hmm. um, and those are those are our ambassadors and they like you you I mean you have a whole different feeling when you, after you get out and physically go through it you say this is something special. Don't want to lose it. I just can't imagine losing the Everglades. It's just beyond my imagination losing it. Um, I was out there and um, it's, it's called, uh, what is it? Um, oh, the re uh, re uh, yeah, it's a little area it's called a reef and it's three foot high elevation. Hmm. You don't have far to go, three hmm. feet. It's not very far. And if you keep going down to, towards Flamingo, you get about, I guess, seven or eight miles from the Flamingo, the, the mangroves are starting to invade. And mm. the black mangroves are dying because of elevation, elevation of water is going up in the ocean. It's, it's, it's happening now and, and uh, there's huge icebergs breaking off and Problem not icebergs, but it's when the, the ice on the land starts melting. And when the, this the fellow, this scientist, told me what's happening underneath the the, the glaciers on in, in in Greenland, it's getting eroded. Water is cutting underneath the ice. So one day this thing just slides off the mountain. We're in real troubles. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. you've got to start thinking about the whole world. I mean, uh, you know, and and you can't you can you can't figure out the kids are going to save it. You got all these old farts up in up in Washington. They're not going to live long enough. They don't care. You know, they're eighty years old, seventy years old. You know, it's uh, it's it's the, it's the old people that have got to solve the problem. They're the ones making the decisions. Yeah, let's let's not let them off the hook. I, I think that's important. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I have one more question from the audience, and then and then I have one more for you. And I know Nancy's going to rejoin us at the end. 
So I'm hoping you can scroll to the picture of, I believe it was a hawk that you showed because the, oh, yeah. the question is about that picture. Oh yeah. James asks, yes, did you take the that, bird um, with extended wing I, photo with- well, There it is. Okay. He wants to know if you took the, the photo with the view camera and long exposure. Can you talk uh, about how you captured this moment? Actually, it was taken with a, um, a Pentax uh, six by seven roll film camera with a uh, 800 mil millimeter lens from my porch. Hmm. Uh, when I was living there, I would have, I, I had my I had Pentax set up on the porch right in front of the window. I see something interesting. I would run up, open the window up, take a picture. I love doing bird photography and air conditioning. The, our porch is a good, it's a, 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 they don't see you in, in the house. So you can just sit there and just all these pictures. Um, that was taken from the porch. Um, but being able to live out in the middle of this, you see things that nobody else gets to see. It's a, it's a stunning spot there. And when I went on the swamp walk, I had the, the pleasure of peeking into the spot where you lived with the floor to ceiling windows and you really feel like you're in the swamp even when you're inside. It's a very special place. Yeah, it's like a uh, IMAX theater. Mm -hmm. Yes, you don't need a TV if you live there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, well, my, my last question for you is, is a personal one. Um, and I want to ask it because we've all been through and are continuing to live through some challenging times with COVID-19. And I feel like you have a really unique perspective on loss, Clyde, um, since you've talked often about um, losing your son in 1986 to a drunk driver and how that um, really propelled you into your art. So it, it I'm wondering how you think this, this era will impact the artwork being made by you and others. Oh, it's really great for me. Cause I get out there. Cause this is a place to go where no people, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> uh, actually I've been doing more photography during this pandemic than before because that's a place to go. It's, it's exciting. Even though with my stroke, I get out with my walker. In fact, I have a new walker now. It's a, you know, how you, when you get out of the hospital with, with a stroke, you have this, this little metal frame walker where you kind of poke along with it. But with the, my walker with the wheels, it's hard to get out in the swamp because you have to lift, you have to lift it up. So when I was out there last, this, this January, I got this new walker and I was able to get out in the swamp about, I don't know, 60, 70 feet out there and take a picture I wanted to take. It was, that's, that's been really exciting, being able to get back in the water after the stroke. Do, do you see other people um, doing important work in, in this hard time? Um, and do you think you know, the artwork that comes out of it will be better? Um, I have a friend, uh, uh, Jeff Ripple, uh, that's doing really great paintings of the Everglades. He's getting out doing it. Um, I don't, there are, it's really exciting. It's really nice to see that people are trying, other photographers are trying to do what I've been doing. Um, unfortunately, they're doing it in color because they don't think it's gonna sell because you gotta have color to make it sell. And it's very difficult to do good black and white work. It's not, it's, it's not easy um, to, to have all, it's, it's kind of, well, Ansel Adams had it figured out. <laughs> he did pretty good. Um, I kind of um, emulated what his, he, he, how I kind of started out was emulating Ansel Adams, uh, Wynn Bullock and uh, Everett Weston. So I was using those as emulation. Now people are emulating me, but most of them are doing it in color. They think it's it's uh, it's pretty. Well, it's pretty, but it's not art. I mean, if you saw this picture on the screen right now, that was in color. You have all that color in the background. You wouldn't see the bird and the bromeliad like you do here. I mean, it, that bird is there. I mean, it's it's standing out. And, and you see the whole environment it's in. It's, uh, I think that 
people it, it, it's well when i when i went from color doing art shows in florida uh, people that were selling black and white were doing probably in sales one hundredth of what i was doing in color I mean, I mean, it was like they were they were hardly paying their 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 gas bill to get to the art show. So it's it's everybody thought I was crazy when I dropped my color because I was the top selling artist in the art shows with color, and everybody thought I had just lost it. I had, <laughs> I had lost it, and I think that uh, doing. I mean, could you imagine selling black and white photographs of the swamp? I mean, <laughs> now we can. It. Think about it. So. I think you certainly can. <laughs> <laughs> but back 30 years ago, I don't know. Because yeah. uh, wow. Ansel Adams in 1971 couldn't sell. He, he was having a hard time selling black and white. Actually, in 72, he went to color. Well, I went to color. But luckily, he got he got out of the color real quick because he. Well, for one thing, when I did color, I did my own enlarging so I could control it, and he was having to send it out. And he couldn't get anybody to do what he wanted to do, so I think he gave it up for a couple of reasons. But I, mean, I also don't think he liked it. Okay. Well, you may have lost it, Clyde, but you you helped all of your your viewers and um, fans find something. So thank you. I've really enjoyed talking to you. I know Nancy's jumped back in uh, from the Arts Council and I'm, I'm going to hand it back over to her. Thanks, Eve. And thanks, Clyde. I, you know, you said you've lost it, but I think what you actually have done is captured it for all of us. So thank you for that, Clyde. Yeah. It um, really is an amazing thing that you've been able to do for all of us. Um, and today was such an interesting and informative talk. So thank you both Eve and Clyde for, for being a part of that. Before yeah. everybody goes, I wanna remind you that our gallery hours here at the Courthouse Cultural Center are Tuesdays from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. and Wednesdays through Saturday, 10 to four. Admission is free, but donations are appreciated. Masks are currently required. And of course we ask them if you're not feeling well to visit another time. Yeah. Um, during Arts Fest weekend, the weekend of February 20th and 21st, which is in uh, the gallery will be open and is included with your Arts Fest admission. We'll have extended hours, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on both Saturday and Sunday that weekend. I hope you come out and enjoy the artists, the music, the dance, and more that Arts Fest celebrates. But if you can't, we are also offering Arts Fest at Home, a virtual taste of Arts Fest. Um, information about all of that can be found at artsfeststuart.org. And again, thank you for participating today. Thank you, Clyde and Eve. And I hope we see everybody at another program sometime soon. Thanks. Well, I, th I think when people see the work in person, they get, get more of excited about it than on television. Nothing it's, like seeing it live. It's really something else when you see it live. Thank That's you. True. Thank you, everybody. Take care.